I was born in America, in a leafy suburb outside New York City. It was much like a Norman Rockwell painting. I had a mother, a father, we had a porch, we had a dog. But what if your life looked different than that? What if you were born on the street, with no parents, with no food in the refrigerator? How would you find your voice? I graduated from college and started my career in journalism. My first days at the New York Times, I was assigned a story on bird watching. I knew nothing about bird watching. I spent three months exhaustively researching everything one could know about birds and bird watching and all the players in the field. But three months does not make an expert. And I learned something critical, which was journalism can often be superficial. There are deadlines to meet. There are editors asking for things. There's space to fill. Um, and I also saw, while I was at the New York Times, they were closing a lot of the foreign news bureaus. And I saw something happening, which was taking Americans to a country that they may not speak the language, they may not understand the culture. They swoop in, and they report a story. And there was something that I came to know as, or call colonial journalism. Um, my life went along. I got married. I had two kids. One of my daughters is the reason I'm here today. Um, they went to school in New York City. We all enjoyed the incredible melting pot that is New York. I think about getting on the subway in the morning, walking through a neighborhood. In the course of a few hours, it's like a passport to the world in New York City. You can be exposed to different religion, different food, different costumes, different stories from all over the world. And we're smushed together in New York. And foreign, in my life, had always been something very valuable and positive. And on a very fateful day that we all shared, sadly, September 11th, everything in New York changed. And suddenly, instead of having foreign be a positive, it became a negative. And I had these two little daughters who I would see after they came home from school. And I put together two notions. And the notion was, if we feel after 9-11 there, that there are others, and that we don't have a shared humanity, and that kids are actually the best reporters there are. They see a situation. They report on it without politics and then without ego. Um, and with this idea of the power of children able to tell stories, I put this together and set off to start a nonprofit called By Kids. And the idea is quite simple. We take complicated global issues. We choose a child somewhere in the world who is curious and charismatic. We pair the child with a film mentor, somebody who is very well known, usually. They work together for a month so that the kid is actually taught how to use the camera, how to take the beginning, middle, of, and end of their story and put it together to tell it compellingly. And we make 30-minute documentaries. We then partner with people who have that same earnest and very compassionate feeling about spreading these stories, uh, usually just about the, the, the power of storytelling generally. We are doing it in a very different way through the voice of these children. We produce a PBS series that's called Films by Kids. Um, and I would like to introduce you to some of our filmmakers. We have thus far made nine films. I'm going to introduce you to Faiza, who is on the right in white, wearing the hijab. We knew after 9-11 that we wanted to do a story about what it felt like to be Muslim in a post-9-11 New York. And we went out and found Faiza. We paired her with the legendary Albert Mazels, who's all the way to the right. Um, he is the documentarian who's done spectacular films from The Salesman to Grey Garden. You may have heard of him. He and Faiza met for the first time. And it started as a conversation. And Albert said to Faiza, you are a young Muslim woman. I am an old Jewish man. But I once heard Margaret Mead speak. And she said, the act of making great art, and in fact making great humanity, 
is that you work long enough that you find common ground. And so, Faisal, why don't you tell me your story and let's see where our common ground is. It didn't take long for Faiza to explain she came in middle school from Yemen with her family. Her father owned a big house in Yemen, gave up everything they'd worked so hard for, gave it all up, and brought his family to America for opportunity. And they came into a post-9-11 New York. And unbeknownst to them, because in Yemen, the Muslims are the majority, she dealt with horrible Islamophobia. Um, and as they talked, Albert got tears in his eyes. And he said, well, would you look at that? We've already found our common ground. I was a young boy, same age as you were in middle school. And I walked with my brother every day in a suburb of Boston. And I was the only Jew. And the Irish kids every day beat us up. And so Faiza, you and I will have a wonderful journey together. And they worked together over the course of a month. Albert taught Faiza everything she needed to know about telling her story. And what I mean when I say tell story, you go into Faiza's life. You sit with her family while they're having meals. She took the camera in. Jamil is the one sitting at the base as her brother-in-law, also from Yemen. He's the highest ranking Muslim in the New York City police force. And she traveled around in the police car, as Jamil describes how he doesn't look Muslim. He's not on the front lines, because if he's not wearing a hijab, he could pass as Puerto Rican. Um, he really was quite remarkable about explaining how Islam is about tolerance and love, and terrorists are terrorists. And he recently, on a panel discussion, said, you know, the Nazis were called Nazis. We don't refer to them as Germans. And the same needs to be true, he says, of Muslims. There are Muslims and there are terrorists. Um, we have, as I said, done nine films about these really big issues, all told through the voice of kids. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to a number of our other filmmakers. You're seeing Edelson, who is 12 years old, made a film with Joy Chopra mentoring her. She and her family have, have generations of coffee growing in Nicaragua. And we start with the premise that we want to hit a globally relevant story. So we started, in this case, with climate change. We worked down to try to find a way to make climate change visual. Edelson made such a spectacular film that captures what climate change has meant for the literally ravaging the coffee source that her family has relied on, her father, her grandfather. Um, and when we start to show these films, not only in schools, we're in half the schools in America and on television, but at film festivals, people say it's very hard to quantify climate change. It's very hard to see the melting of a glacier. But Edelson, in her 12-year-old, Wisdom has made an incredible film. Um, I'd like to introduce you next to Maria. Maria made a film about displacement in Colombia. Um, we were trying to find a film to express what displacement means. Uh, we found Maria in Colombia. She made a spectacular film about her father being killed by the guerrillas. Most of the Civil War, if not all of it, in Colombia is related to the drug trade, um, which pertains back to the American students that our films are being screened for. The film was on TV. Malala, about three months ago, or right before she showed up at Oxford, found us because of the film and invited Maria to meet with her in Mexico City. So this idea that a voice of a kid can have ripples out beyond their community and have a real impact on the way people talk about these huge issues. The power of the kid telling the story is the game changer. It's something about the melting of your heart, because the one thing we all had in, have in common might not be our race, might not be our religion, but we were all children. And there's something about when these kids tell their stories in such a personal way that is is elevating compassion and empathy. Um, I'd like to introduce you quickly to Jayshree, who is one of the 80 million tribal people in India. Um, Jayshree is 
tough as nails. She said, I am going to fight my culture. I'm going to fight my family. I am not going to be the oldest sibling who takes care of the little kids. I'm staying in school. And she has worked nobly to make sure she stayed in school. A lot of our efforts are in schools. And it's an amazing experience to have some kid in middle school watch a film like this, have the lights come up, and say, that film made me realize how lucky I am to have an education. I never knew how lucky I was. So this idea that these stories from far away that can really touch the heartstrings and engender an element of gratitude is something we're really interested in trying to do more of. I'd like to introduce you to Trichen, who is, if Tibet had not been taken over by China, and if the government in exile had not been, had not chosen to be a democracy, Trichen, who is the uh, descendant of the great kings of Tibet, the ones that were responsible for bringing Buddhism and the Tibetan language to Tibet, our young Trichen filmmaker uh, would be the king. Um, and he tells a powerful, incredible story from this kind of weird, you know, how many people do you know that's a would-be king? But Trichen talks about what it's like to have the mantle of responsibility, of family legacy weighing on his shoulders. Um, and the, the, my favorite story about having Trichen, who came to the US and did touring with his film, was we were at a middle school in Queens that was heavy on the Chinese American population. And a very shy little girl asked him when the Q&A time came, said, Trichen, my father taught me a very different history about Tibet and China. And Trichen very elegantly said to this young girl, I don't want you to disrespect your father in any way. I want you to listen to what he says. I want you to go learn Tibetan history from another perspective and maybe read Ameri an American historian about the history of Tibet. And once you've read the three differing perspectives, come to your own conclusion. And she looked at him and gave him a hug. And as we were walking away, I heard her say, Trichen, would you go to the prom with me next week? <laughs> and I knew that the fate of my kids was in good hands, because if, if that could warm, anything can warm. And they had found their common ground. Um, I would like to introduce you to Alcides, who at the age of 15 made a film for us in Mozambique about losing his parents to AIDS. Again, one of these very complicated, distant stories. And the, my favorite story, Alcides was mentored by the showrunner for Law and Order SVU, an amazing man named Neil Baer. Um, they worked together hard on this film, and we were out screening it. And again, there was a fourth grade teacher in a teeny little town in Iowa that was the site of one of the big prisons. And this teacher wrote me after the screening and said, so you know, we watched this film, and it's told with such humanity. And Alcides is so brave in the way that he found family and pulled a stranger in to take care of him. And he wheels her to church a mile and a half every day, back and forth, in return for a place to live. And this resonated with my kids in such a fundamental way, because most of the kids in this town in Iowa have parents in prison. And this idea that he was an AIDS orphan resonated with them, so much so that they were all in tears at the end of the film. Um, last and certainly not least, we are setting off doing five new films for season two on PBS. You see here Nadai, Nadai Fatu, who is a Senegalese 12-year-old, who very candidly says, if I had been born in 1990, I would be married and probably have one or two children. And she is not married yet, um, and she's going on to have an amazing education. We have four other films as part of season two. We have a film being done about uh, the Syrian refugee crisis by a young boy in Berlin who came on a raft is a very classic story. And we have uh, the climate change film. We've got a film about da, 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 um, Bhutan and how Bhutan legalized television in 1999 and have an extraordinary level of depression and suicide. And um, I'm going to do a little experiment with you guys. We are really in the business of trying to 
allow people to understand the things that they don't know they don't know. So I'm going to put up a slide, and I'm going to ask you to finish that sentence. Don't have to say anything out loud, but be very honest with yourself. I know how I answered this. Well, I'm proud to say that Faiza is happy to be an American. She is a terrific poet, and she is a spectacular filmmaker. Um, and this, this piece that we did was a 27 second piece that we did all about implicit bias and about how our stories can often be put on people and that this ability to say, my name is Holly, what's your story, is one of the most powerful things you can do to live in a more peaceful world. Teachers are a really important part of what we're doing. The idea, the, the really innovative piece of this is that in education, you don't hear from kids normally. You don't hear through moving image, typically. And kids are not being taught to be empathetic. And these films have a tremendous way of opening these hearts so that people are not just learning to be global citizens and understand stories from far, far away that are maybe not as dissimilar as your own, but it allows you to really open your heart. So my hope for you today is that you work on telling your own story and that you make sure to ask people around you what their story is and that you really can walk in life with an open heart about this amazing, wonderful world we live in. Thank you.